Hello and welcome to The Swim Brief. The Swim Brief is brought to you by my employer, Jersey Wahoo Swim Club, a USA swimming silver medal club in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. You can read up more about how Jersey Wahoo's brought this podcast back on chrisdcoach.com. That's C-H-R-I-S-D as in DeSantis, coach.com. Jersey Wahoo's provides all levels of swimming instruction from learn to swim to national level competition training since 1972. Wahoos has been one of the best clubs in the Middle Atlantic LSE, and we're proud of a tradition that values trust, honesty, and respect. This week on the podcast, I'm joined by myself. I decided to uh, do an edition this week that's uh, kind of going to be a little bit of a video blog, um, if you could say. Instead of writing, I'm going to talk on a few topics, um, some stuff that uh, we're not going to get to on the Thursday pod when I bring in. Uh, Joel and Eric. Uh, if you're looking for some conversation about the uh, really big changes to the Division One NCAA meet, listen in on that one. We'll probably have some other stuff uh, in that one to discuss. But I, I have some sort of like bigger end themed stuff that uh, I wanted to get into today on the podcast. Um, the first one is something that applies to the coaching world uh, as we look towards some return to some version of normal uh, from this pandemic. One of the things that uh, I haven't seen a lot of discussion out there about is how much the pandemic has restricted movement in coaching. So um, one of my perverse hobbies that I have every year is, you know, sometime right around March, April, um, I start monitoring the NCA official job board. This is essentially where where many uh, college swim coaching jobs get uh, an official posting. And um, every year, uh, except for the last one, there's a lot of movement. Um, people refer to it as the coaching carousel, right? Or the coaching game of musical chairs, because you know it. 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 First off, the hiring pool for any NCAA coaching job, fair or not, is usually other NCAA coaches. So it'll start with maybe one or two or three openings somebody will go from one place to another and that creates an opening at the other place so um except for this past spring it's not that there weren't some changes but there were very very few changes and i think there's a good reason for that um first off i think anybody that was thinking about leaving their job you know to do something else um, probably a lot of them probably put that on hold because of how much uncertainty there is out there. Um, and any athletic director that was thinking like, hey, we really need to make a change here, I think also probably uh, just looking at the hiring landscape and their ability to find new people they probably also uh, were hesitant to do that. And so as we look to, you know, a possibility by this summer that there's a lot more mobility, at least within the United States, um, I'm curious to see whether things, like whether there's actually a backlog of people, individuals wanting to move on to one thing or another and athletic uh, administration that, you know, uh, <laughs> have been secretly plotting to sack their coach and um, just haven't done so yet. Uh, the other thing that's at play here is typically the biggest year for coaching movement, um, and this goes beyond college, is an Olympic trials year uh, because a lot of um, higher end teams sort of they 
they have either uh, coaches have you know committed to stay through an Olympic quad, which is now becoming a whatever you call when it's five years anyway. Um, they, they've they've committed to stay through a certain amount of time, um, or um, there are there are you know everybody gets together in Omaha, which I guess won't really happen uh, this time around in the same form, but you know. Uh, everybody gets together and gossips a little bit and um, you know it, it you can't understate how much people being in the same physical location drives hiring um, because still coaching is an industry that really relies on a lot of very informal processes especially around hiring that's why NCA uh, coaching jobs draw so much from other NCA places, but even beyond that, you know, people put a big value on personal relationships um, for filling uh, a lot of positions, and it's hard to think about who you might hire um, if you're not seeing other people and getting that face-to-face -face interaction. So that's one thing that um, I'm just sort of watching curiously to see if, you know, things change here um, in the spring, summer, and there's more mobility. Will it sort of unleash uh, some pretty dramatic upheaval, not only in the college ranks, where I think um, is, is where I usually do it. In fact, now I'm so, um, now I don't manually check. I actually have the NCA job board send me an email when anything's posted. Um, just, so, just so you know, Jersey Wahoos people, I'm not looking for a job. It's, uh, as I said, it's just a weird hobby that I have um, because uh, from, from preceding me ever being a coach, um, you know, I, I definitely had a period in my life where NCA coaching was all I wanted to do. So I sort of got in the habit of doing it. And now now I do it more for curiosity's sake than anything. Um, I just like following it. Um, but also, you know, are things going to change in the club ranks as well? Whether Will there be a sort of significant backlog and uh, shift? Speaking of coaches who definitely are not going to get fired. In fact, uh, the only <laughs> future I could foresee is um, either a, a massive raise or... Uh, getting hired uh, for a lot more money to coach someone else. Lars Jørgensen, and that's right, yes, I said it the Danish way, Lars, as you might say in America, Lars Jorgensen, okay? Um, I want to give a shout-out to him on winning an SEC title at Kentucky. Uh, probably less people uh, paying attention and maybe even some salty people <laughs> putting an asterisk on the, the COVID year. Um, but I think it is an absolutely amazing accomplishment to um, win an SEC title at Kentucky. It's been a long time coming. Uh, it's been part of a multi, multi-year project there. Um, and uh, they did it on the backs of just an outstanding team performance. Um, so kudos to Lars, and uh, I want to use this as a, a segue um, to start building something. You know, I've been looking to get enough members, um, and so I'm, I'm going to start with a very incomplete list. We'll build this up over time, but um, you know, as um, as a Danish person, um, and I know Lars is. I mean, you look at a picture. Um, of Lars and like if you just showed me a photo of a guy and said like hey is this guy Danish I'd go yeah okay um, so and I know that Lars' uh, dad um, I believe was born in Denmark so he's kind of like uh, Danish on the on the same level uh, that I am uh, I've always been too chicken to come speak Danish to him on a pool deck but you know maybe again if you uh, refer to the earlier conversation, maybe if standing on a pool deck again, uh, just chatting it up with our coaches becomes a thing in 2021, I'll uh, I'll get the courage up 
to um, uh, throw throw a few Danish phrases um, at Lars. Um, anyway, there have been some very, very successful swimmers. Lars, one of them, by the way, um, great distance swimmer in his time as an athlete, and uh, who have obviously Danish looking names. Um, and so I'm gonna start throwing these guys on the uh, all time Danish American team that uh, I am building for nobody other than myself. Um, if I segue from Lars to another distance swimmer, we have the confusingly named Larsen Jensen, um, or as we would say with our uh, Danish twain, Larsen Jensen. Um, <laughs> uh, I say confusingly named because people, uh, okay, one of the, I'm gonna give you a couple dead giveaways for Danish names. Um, you know, uh, in old uh, Scandinavian times, uh, patronymics were really common. So that's why you have a lot of people with some version of sin at the end of their name. Um, they're actually still uh, common to do this in Iceland because Iceland is like, you know, the last true country of Vikings. So, you know, you have people with daughter or son actually at the end of their names and it really is their father's name and then, you know, daughter. Um, and so if you take like the EN off of some of these names, you get some of the most common um, Danish names, okay? Jens, um, my, uh, my uh, Danish au pair's uh, husband, um, eventual husband, then boyfriend, when I was a little kid, his name was Jens. And I remember he wore a cool leather jacket and smoked cigarettes out in front of my house. But anyway, um, Jensen is probably one of the most common, like one of the five most common last names in Denmark. And by the way, um, the S-E-N version is most common in Denmark. Um, the S-O-N versions are more common in other Scandinavian countries. Um, the double S is sometimes uh, more of a giveaway that it's uh, Icelandic. Um, so the, the reason I say it's confusing though is because um, usually you wouldn't put the an SEN, like a patronymic name, as a first name. So Larsen Jensen is like, has like two or Larsen Jensen has two last names, basically. It's almost as if his name was, um, uh, Danielson, uh, Martinson. Like, it's just, um, it's a little strange, but you know, he grew up on the West Coast. Um, I guess I'll forgive him for that. Maybe he had, uh, Danish hippie parents that thought it would be cool to uh, give him two last names. Um, so we've got we've got Lars, we've got Larson Jensen, and then I can't leave him out. Brendan Hansen, okay, H A N S E N. Brendan, if you're out there, congratulations! You're on the all-time Danish American team, okay. I I actually don't know um, <laughs> where where the Hansen comes from, and you're gonna break my heart if um, after recording this, I find out that, you know, actually there was some uh, sneaky uh, other Scandinavian, uh, you know, if I find out that somehow you're Norwegian, which is the most likely other country you're from, I'm gonna be heartbroken. Uh, I'm gonna have to take you off the Danish American team, but uh, don't worry, we'll, we'll find some more. Um, do you know people? that uh, have a strong Scandinavian American background, uh, Danish American background who have swum really fast, uh, write me a message, let me know, so I can continue to build out the all-time Danish American team. Okay, the final topic I don't wanna to get to today is will David Curtis make the Olympic team? I saw an article on Swim Swam earlier this week uh, talking about David Curtis swimming in 1977 
in the 50 free. He's got a great long course 50 free from just a, a little bit ago, 21-8. Um, he's still in high school, 18 years old. And this one is, um, this one I, I have a little bit more personal insight into in that um, I actually saw him break the national independent high school record. I was the meet announcer for the meet that he did it at a uh, well, it was just about a year ago uh, when he went 19-4. That was his junior year of high school. Um, and it didn't seem unconceivable um, that uh, he could go under 22 seconds in a 53 at that time. I mean, he is um, not the biggest, most physically imposing uh, 50 freestyler you've ever seen. And um, he definitely still has uh, a lot of room for improvement in terms of starts and turns and all that kind of stuff. Um, so a 50 free where he can just sort of get in and uh, get up to his top speed and carry that through the race, like I, I, could, I, I can see um, how he will be really successful in that. Now, he's got the fastest time in America. Um, do I think that he will make the team? I, I, I wrestled with this. Like I even came into recording the podcast going, I'm going to argue for yes because it's more fun. I'm going to say no. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is I think there's a couple of factors that are going to make it really, really challenging for him, despite how fast he is, despite the fact that he probably um, is on a much steeper improvement curve than some of the other people that he's going to be competing against in the 50. You can see, like, it, career wise, you know, Caleb Dressel is quite a bit ahead of him. Um, Michael Andrew is a little bit ahead of him, but you know, improvement um, is probably leveling off a little bit more. But the reason I say uh, what, to sort of two major challenges that I think he's going to face, um, the, the first one is gonna be um, purely the atmosphere and pressure of an Olympic trials. Um, you know, he's going to be going up against people in that event who have experienced swimming at, at trials. Um, now, Michael Andrew uh, did make the last Olympic trials um, and made it out of the opening rounds of stuff. So he's actually got quite a bit of an experience advantage on Curtis. And I, I think that's going to be important. Um, that's not to say that it's impossible to do well at your first Olympic trials. Plenty of people do that. Um, but it's going to be, it's going to be a, um, it's going to be something, there's going to be an aspect of it that you just cannot prepare for. So that's, that's one part. Um, the second part is I think that sometimes people do a really fast 50 free, um, in essentially what is open water. Like they don't have a pool full of people uh, going around the same speed as them. And I think particularly with uh, somebody who's physically, you know, not like 6'6", six, six, like not a, not a Florent Manadu type, um, where the waves, uh, where you're just sort of so big that the waves bounce off you. Lane placement is going to be really important for, for Curtis. Um, this also was very important for Anthony Irvin in his career. Um, you know, for him to uh, have that space, because he also struggled quite a bit with his start. Um, I think he, he got probably the best start of his life when he won the Olympics. So that was a huge factor for him. But um, I saw him swim a lot of races where... He didn't get a great start, and he was in the middle of the pool with a bunch of big guys creating a lot of waves, and it was hard for him to get clean water um, at the start of the race, and that meant that he never quite got up to his top speed. And it also meant, like, some of those... I've wrote, written about this in a blog that, that like, his um, 100 freestyle title from uh, Fukuoka in Japan... Uh, 
he he goes out crazy fast um and uh you know it actually works for him because he gets that clean water it's not it's not what a swim coach would draw up on the you know pre uh pre meet plan like oh you're gonna you know keep these splits within one and a half seconds of each other you know it's not it's not that but it is uh, for him, in, in many scenarios, a legit chance. That said, it's it's really exciting. You know, I think that um, as you know, swimmers' careers go on longer and longer. Like I saw Nathan Adrian make uh, the Olympic team in 2008, and here he is. Like he's going to be racing it out with David Curtis here uh, um, for. Uh, for the for a spot in one of these sprint races and um, he's still really on top of his game so um, you know as those sort of careers go off and you get sort of generations bumping up against each other like you know 30 years ago Nathan Adrian would have been uh, probably long retired from from competing Um, so that definitely makes it a lot harder um, because in a previous generation I think a, an exceptional talent like David Curtis would have a really good chance, uh, really, really like, you know, better than 50% chance to make a, an Olympic team. Um, and I think we will still see that, you know, if um, if uh, if a 16-year-old that's, you know, 90% the 16-year-old or 15, I guess it's 15, 15-year-old Michael Phelps was when... Um, when he swam at the Olympics, you know, comes around again, um, they will have a good chance to to make it. Um, certainly, always a possibility on the women's side. It seems much harder uh, on the men's side with, with sort of the continued development that a lot of guys uh, make a huge improvement from 15 to 25 years old. Um, so we'll see. Um, as I said on a previous podcast, I'm getting really excited for the Olympics and to be able to watch Olympic trials, even though, um, you know, I, uh, I had made plans uh, this time last year to uh, come out and watch trials and, you know, just get, get to be a part of that because I, I was there in 2008, 2012. Um, I was out of the country in 2016, so I didn't get to go. So I was feeling like really good, but uh, it doesn't seem like it's in the cards for me to be able to go to the meet. So I'm going to have to be like most people um, watching at home, but um, I'm just getting really excited for another Olympic year and to see some really fast swimming. That's it for the podcast this week. I hope you enjoyed uh, some of this conversation. As always, send in your comments, uh, fill out a contact form at christycoach.com, and I will see you on Thursday.